you're up. All right, and we're live. We're back in plenary <laughs> session, joined by the one and only Dr. Vinay Prasad, <laughs> associate professor and hematologist oncologist at the University of California, San Francisco, and host of the plenary session. But today it's a reverse host session. My name is Logan Powell. I am the creator of the plenary session show notes and today's host. I'm an incoming medical student this summer, but we're joined today to discuss Malignant's first year anniversary. So Vinay, congratulations on your, your one year mark. <laughs> thank you so much, Logan. Thank you for having me. And thank you for hosting this podcast. It's a real pleasure to sit down and talk with you. On the one year anniversary, that's right, one year since the book came out. What did we accomplish? We just, uh, we made it a year. That's all we did. <laughs> that's all we did. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's all that matters. So I've got a, a list of questions for you today all right. um, to kind of <clears throat> commensurate this, this, uh, this achievement. And then we'll, uh, we'll kind of probe you some questions and push you. And to preface this conversation, you have not been given these questions. Whether I have not been given. I've not seen these questions. It could be anything. That's right. <laughs> so this is not like everything you see on social media. This is unscripted. This is off the cuff. <laughs> This is the real deal. It's the real plenary session. The <laughs> real plenary so, session. That's right, yeah. That's right. All right, so first question. You know, right. a bit of a background. You know, you've written a lot. You've written over 200 academic papers. Some say. Dozens some of say. blogs. <laughs> yeah, some dozens say. of blogs. And yeah. one other book titled Ending Medical Reversal, which was your first book. That's right. Which you co-authored with Dr. Adam Sifu. That's right. But I'd like to take a step back before taking a deep dive into Malignant and ask about the Genesis story. From my understanding, a colleague pushed you to write Malignant, or at least that's what I read on Twitter. So where were you in your career, and then where did the idea from this book originate? All right, that's a great question. I guess I would say, um, you know, um, I had finished the book, Ending Medical Reversal, I think when I was a fellow, and uh, it came out when I was in my first year as faculty. Uh, and then the first few years of faculty, I was doing different work in oncology, I had sort of pivoted more to the oncology drug space, critical of the cost, the uncertain efficacy. Um, and uh, I was also on Twitter, for better or worse. And these days, now I know what the answer was worse. But at the time, I didn't know. Um, and so I was on Twitter, using it, getting a lot of pushback. You know, the same thing that today, if I were to tweet it, would probably get a lot of um, acclaim. Uh, five years ago was getting a lot more pushback. It was a very different climate. I mean, you couldn't talk about control arm quality and post-protocol care and these kinds of things. Um, and so I had been having Twitter arguments, one argument on this part of the debate, one argument on, so, on, on cost. Um, and it was my friend, Sean Mylan Cody, who's a faculty member at Sloan Kettering, who said, look, um, you know, you're doing all this work in these different spaces. And he and I had been doing a fair bit of work together at that point. Um, and he says that, you know, um, part of the reason why the debate is so tough is there's no one place people can go and see why these issues are interconnected. Why do surrogate endpoints and the cost of the drugs, why do those go together? Um, and so he said, you know, you really ought to sit down and write this into a book. Um, and that way it will spare you some Twitter arguments because you'll be able to say like, look, it's all in here. I'm showing you how it all links together. Um, and, uh, and, and now hopefully, you know, you get why this is an issue. And so I think that was what was the sort of immediate motivation. I think it was 2017 that I started thinking about it in the fall. And I think I wrote um, most of it uh, in a six month period of time in beginning of 2018. And then the rest of it was just the laborious process to get something to, to, to market. Yeah. To publish. Yeah. That's the longest Man, so part. You, you, you hammered this book out. Um, were you extremely motivated or did you have this blueprint already in your head? Like, how did you tackle this book? Well, I guess I think, I don't know, you might know this about me, but um, if I've spent a lot of time thinking about something and talking about something, then it's already sort of structured in my mind. Like, I know how I talk about it. You've probably listened to this podcast, so you know, people hear me give the same lecture over and over again, and it's actually remarkably similar. But it wasn't that way when I first looked into the topic. I had spent a lot of time reading about it and learning about it. But then finally, I'm like, this is how I tell it to myself, how I tell it to others. And so... Um, you know, uh, the moment that kind of set ge gels in your mind, uh, I think it's pretty easy to write. And so I write very quickly, probably as quickly as I talk, really, um, uh, 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 sort of at that pace, once I thought about it. But there are parts of Malignant that I hadn't fully worked out in my mind, and those were the slower parts. And then finally trying to connect everything together in a parsimonious way was a little bit slower. But, you know, I guess, um, I, guess uh, I, I do write quickly. That is, that is something that's true. That's good. That's good. I, I've heard you make that quote before. I think it's a Twain quote. I'm not sure, but the 
whoever it goes to, it's it's long periods of thinking and and short periods of writing. The Hemingway, along that's a Hemingway line. quote. But the but Hemingway the Twain quote, quote that's right. the, the Twain quote I really like is that I could not write you a I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. Uh, which is yeah. sort of yeah, which is sort of related. Which is if you really thought about it a lot, you know how to put it very crisply. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, so when you're going through this process and you had this six month writing period. What was one of, the, one of the most surprising things that you learned while writing the book? Hmm, that's a good question. What kind of hit you from the broadside? I mean, I think one of the most surprising things in the book is the origin story of the response rate, that uh, quote unquote dinner party at Charles Mortel's house, but that famous 1976 cancer paper. But I think to be perfectly fair, I think I had known that before I was writing. Um, and so I guess I'm trying to think, like, did I learn anything while I was writing? Um, I don't know, probably a couple of the clinical trials in there I hadn't taken a deep dive into. And so I took a deep dive when I was writing in sort of the third section of the book where it's how do we read and interpret clinical trials. Um, but I think a lot of it was just the stuff I'd been saying. So it wasn't like that was the moment I discovered those concerns or issues, but I was trying to articulate it as clearly and simply as I could. Um, I think the book is, you know, I had been toying around with the ideas of how do you think about crossover? And um, I think, you know, Allison Haslam and I were the first to ever propose that there's two types of crossover. There's situations where you don't want it and there's situations where you do want it and you can either get it or not get it. And so that kind of four quadrant model we had proposed in the Annals of Oncology. Um, but, you know, to me, that was sort of a revelation just to start to think about it that way. Now I see that conceptual framework has taken off, like other people use it. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that, that but I, I mean, I think the answer to your question is probably yes. But it didn't occur to me when I was writing the book. It occurred when I was writing the papers that are cited in the book. At each of those papers, there was a surprise moment, which is, you know, how often do drugs that get approved later show survival benefit? Oh, surprise, you know, lower than you thought. Um, when people say unmet medical need, it, do they always mean rare and dire situations? Oh, surprise. No, they don't always mean that. So, you know, those were all individual surprise moments. And then trying to pull it all together in a coherent narrative was, I guess, the task of the book. And also trying to write at a level that somebody like you, um, you know, you're very sharp, but you're not an oncologist. Um, uh, so that's kind of who I was aiming for, um, you know, that, that somebody like you could read it and, and not be put, a, put off by it. Yeah. And that's, where did you, where did you, uh, did you have that approach in mind? Because when I read like Gilbert Welch's books, yes, you know, you know, seven, seven assumptions, that book, I forgot the, the whole title, yeah. but that's written for the lay audience. Is that what your goal was for malignant? <laughs> I, uh, I think yes. And, and kind of no, here's, here's what I mean by that. Um, one, I'm influenced by Gil Welch too. I mean, I read all, I've read multiple of his books. I read, should I be treated for cancer? Maybe not. Here's why I read overdiagnosis. I read less medicine, more health, the seven, uh, thing, you know, that book that you're alluding to. Um, and, and I guess what I would say is that, um, I can't tell who he's writing for, which is part of the beauty of it, because I was a health professional, or at least training to be when I started reading these books. Um, it connected with me, you know, I didn't feel like he was dumbing it down. I also, uh, you know, read him, I think the first one when I was a medical student, um, I did I certainly didn't feel like it was over my head. And so I think that this is something that is true. Um, you know, uh, no matter what you're talking about, but if you really have a grasp of what you want to say, and you really understand the issue inside and out, you should be able to explain it to somebody at a dinner party. You know, so I, I reject the premise that if you really know something, you cannot explain it. There's too much terminology. You need to unpack that terminology. You need to think of analogies to convey that to somebody. Um, and so the answer to your question is yes, I want the book to be able to be read by somebody who's in college, you know, somebody who is uh, a sharp high school student. I want that person to be able to read it. But I also write it at that level so that the oncologist um, who reads it will also say, hey, this is readable. This is engaging. You know, it's not the kind of boring stuff that we are usually, uh, you know, given to read. And so I'm trying to uh, hit all these audiences. And I personally like things, um, you know, at that level, like readable, like Gil Welsh level. Um, but I do think I've read a lot of books where they, they dumb it down too much and I can see, you know, the holes in it. I'm like, nah, that's not, I'm not a fan of that. So keep it as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yeah. I like the way you put that. Um, and I can definitely see it after reading the book that you did capture that because sometimes you'll read like a book on philosophy and it's covered in this dense vocabulary that you can't even penetrate. Like you'll read a page and you're like, I have no idea what he's saying, but does he even know what he's saying? Right. And obviously you know what you're saying because you read it, you wrote it in a very coherent manner. So no, thanks. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so these next questions are kind of going to go from broad to more narrow. And I just want to open this one with, you know, why do you think malignant is a must read, quote unquote, must read for medical trainees or anyone interested in cancer evidence and health policy? Okay, I guess I would say uh, no bias, but <laughs> I guess I say it obviously is a bias. But I mean, I think um, I think uh, I've read the vast majority of cancer books. I saw somebody recently saying that uh, they had worked their way through cancer books and they had a stack on their floor and took a picture of it. You know, it's taller than their kiddo or something like that. Um, and I guess when I saw that, I, I looked at that list of books and I had also probably read most, the majority of those books. Um, and I guess I would say that my first my first point of contention is that there is nothing in the field of oncology that I think is like this book. And it really does fill uh, the niche, the niche that I think needs to be filled. What do I mean by that? I mean, I think if you look at the set of books people think are popular reads in cancer, you know, probably a third or half are going to be um, sort of a first person narrative of cancer, somebody who experienced cancer, a doctor who cares for cancer patients, the story of let me tell you about Susie, a 75 year old lady who came to me one day with uh, bleeding gums, you know, you know, that kind of sort of classic uh, genre of, of doctor writing. Uh, this is not that book, you know, this is not a book, this is not a storytelling book. It's not a book that's going to make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. Um, that's not the goal. I think there are a number of other books that are kind of historical views of cancer. Um, I think about Death, with Can De Death of Cancer by DeVita. I think about the Mukherjee book. I mean, these are books that that show you what cancer was like um, and what it is like, but the part on what it is like is a very narrow portion of the end of the book. I mean, it's mostly the long arc of history uh, from Farber, from Davida, from you know uh, Fry and Freilich. Uh, you know, it, it's that sort of arc. And and again, this is not that book. You know, I'm not giving you the history of oncology. I think that's interesting. Um, however. Uh, I don't think that's what you need to know the most if you're a trainee. I think that can be inspirational. That inspires a lot of people to go into oncology. Um, but I don't think that's what you need to know the most. And so this book really picks up for the person who has to live in the world today, uh, 2021, and you're an oncologist. What do you need to know? Well, there's lots of things you need to know about the cost of drug drug development, how the companies are pursuing compounds, what trials they're running, which trials they're running, why the trials are redundant, duplicative, why the sample sizes are so large, why the, 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 the deltas are so small. You need to understand why does that happen? Why are non-inferiority bounds so big? Um, so th these sorts of technical questions about the cost and, and the trial design. You also need to understand, I think, the landscape of hype, where money flows through the system, how the FDA approves drugs, what is a surrogate endpoint? Why do we even think about surrogate endpoints? Um, you need to understand how do you practice oncology when somebody is asymptomatic and have a pre-cancer condition or they have an early cancer condition? What is the sort of evidence you need to impose a treatment? What has it been in the recent history, not the distant history, but in the 1990s and the 1980s? And then what are some examples where, you know, we thought things would work. They deepened response rate, they improved PFS, but they ended up not improving OS or, or, or we, we tested for something very aggressively. We found cancer earlier, but that didn't have a commensurate increase in OS. And so this book is really a book for somebody who has to practice or think about or work with or, or, or live with cancer in 2021. It's not going to be the historical look. It's not going to be a, 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 a narrative. Uh, it's going to be sort of a uh, sort of a philosophical and policy look at how these pieces interact and how the net result is a system that I think is deeply suboptimal for cancer patients. And, and we doctors who are supposed to be steering the ship, we have become complicit in this. Um, and so I think of all those books, if I, with my bias, putting my, you know, accepting my bias, I think it's, it, it would be the most important for somebody who's a Hemong fellow to read. You will know more about how to read the trials, how to talk in Tuesday's journal club um, than from all those other books. I mean, not, not that there's anything wrong with those books, but they're just not as on point for what you, what you need to work on. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not a biography of cancer. It's uh you, you know, you have a lot of philosophical views in it, but a lot of it is the nuts and bolts, which I think is so um, important about that book. And it's not only for Heme Onk fellows, um, you know, for incoming medical students or people even interested in medicine, um, it hits a lot of common themes that can be extrapolated to other specialties um, just to get you start to, just to make you to, to start to think. Um, but we have a question from the audience. Okay. I got this question from a friend of mine, a a man on Wall Street, a banker who knows nothing about medicine, okay. but he wants to learn more. He wants to learn more. And talking about themes, I believe his question hits a common narrative in the book. And I'll preface the question with a short story. Um, I tell a friend that in the oncology space, we are approving drugs, 
based on outcomes that have little to do with the patient, aka surrogate endpoints, et cetera. I think that's right. But the problem compounds when one accounts that the price of these drugs has a large impact on society's tax dollars, which is something you talk about a lot. You know, these things are costing upwards of $10,000 a month or more. And his response in question is, where does this problem even start? And what is the root issue? That's a great question. Okay, so I guess I would say, what is the root issue? I mean, I think the root issue, I think, is is the regulators. I mean, I think that's what I make the case for in the book. Maybe that's not the root of the problem. Maybe the problem is deeper. Um, but the root of the fix is the regulators, because that's the only place that the public can exert their influence in the system and try to correct this, these deficiencies. But what is the root problem of the system? The root problem is, I think, there are some drugs that are really good. We talk about those a lot, and I talk about them in the book. There are some drugs that are that are that are decent that that we all enjoy having in our clinics. They are definitely steps forward. And then they're the average drug that comes to market, or the drugs that just kind of clear that bar. And those drugs have a lot of uncertainty. You know, I often don't know if people live longer, live better as a result of having that drug on the market. I certainly don't know that when I start to factor in that the patients in the real world are older and frailer and have comorbidities versus those in the trial. I certainly don't know that when I start to think about the toxicities of these drugs. And I certainly don't feel like I'm in a good place to think about these drugs when I'm bombarded by a campaign of hype. And so, you know, on this podcast, we've talked about many of these drugs, uh, drugs that, you know, they have uh, some response rate. But you know what? If you gave an old fashioned drug like cyclophosphamide, you'll get the same response rate. So why would I want to give your new drug? Well, you know, it has a novel mechanism of action. Yeah. Okay. But it's more toxic. You know, there are more people, more discontinuations, more grade, grade five AEs, more grade four AEs. You know, it looks terrible, more, more drug redu dose reductions. Um, so, uh, so, and yet the drug is like priced at like 200 grand a year. You know, so these are the intertwined problems. And so I guess I would say, you know, some of the core deficiencies are um, uh, uh, one, the FDA approves drugs and they're approving them as fast as ever. And that keeps so many people happy in the ecosystem. The companies are happy. Um, I think the providers are happy. The people running the trials are happy. The patient advocacy groups who are funded by the companies, they're happy. Um, but the people who aren't happy are the average person in society whose premiums are going up, whose real wages are stagnating or declining because we're paying more in healthcare. And this person is seeing, you know, more and more of their paycheck go off to healthcare. And what is that really saying? It's saying like, we're going to take this money from you and we're going to collect it from everybody. And we're going to offer a service to everybody that we believe is a um, human right, the right to have good healthcare. And I actually support that. I believe that is a human right. But it's a human right to have things that actually benefit you. It's not, a, is it a human right to have snake oils or things that don't work? That I think is actually a financial product. I mean, if I make a molecule that is patentable and I give it to cancer patients in a trial and I find some, you know, change in biomarker and I give it to people in the real world, not a single one of them or nobody in aggregate lives a day longer and their quality of life is the same. What have I created? It's something that you call a medicine, you know? You call it a medicine, but people aren't living longer. They're not living better with my medicine, hypothetically. It's not a medicine. It's a financial product. It's a product that actually collects wealth from lots of people, from middle-class people, from poor people, and it shovels that wealth into the hands of a few shareholders of this company. It is a reverse financial product. It's like a regressive financial product. And I think part of the reason why the system is as broken as it is is that the people who lobby to keep the system the way it is or to change the system are the people reaping the money from these reverse financial products. They're making a lot of money from drugs that offer next to nothing, if not nothing. Um, and so, so as long as you have that system, a small group of people with a deep interest in keeping it the way it is versus everybody on the other side who's losing just a little bit of money from their paycheck, but they don't really have the motivation to read about this and learn about it and fight this system, um, I think you 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 will forever cater to the minority interest. Uh, a small vocal minority will always defeat a disinterested majority. I think that's the core tension here. Um, I think the place for the public to use their power is regulation. How do we approve the drugs, think about the drugs, and how do we reimburse for the drugs? Uh, I think the public has not done that because there are very few people who've been able to articulate where the deficiencies are. Um, but I guess that's my answer to your friend, which is that you know there have long been feudal systems where average workers kick up some of their wealth to the elites. And, and to some degree, when you have cancer drugs that don't work, you have created a feudal system. We're all kicking up our wealth so that some people get really rich. And whether or not we get better health for it is an uncertainty. And I think that's the crux of the issue. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And I'll be sure to send him that portion of the podcast.
Um, because I certainly could not explain it like that. So I said, I'm going to ask Vinay here on, in the next couple of days, and then I'll send you the answer. So perfect. Um, recently, you interviewed Dr. Avi Loeb, yes. former department chair of astronomy at Harvard. He has two common phrases he likes. Per your use. recommendation, but yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> but he has two common phrases he really likes to use, and I love to hear them. Number one is follow the evidence. And number two is keep your eye on the ball. In the context of malignant, where are we or are we not following the evidence? And are we keeping our eye on the ball? Oh, the answer is no and no. Uh, so follow the evidence. So one, I, you know, I, when you recommended that I check out Avi Loeb stuff, I was like, uh, I was skeptical initially. Uh, what will I learn from an astronomer uh, and physicist? But I ended up think, you know, telling you it was like the best thing I listened to. Um, and uh, so I appreciate that, Rec, because uh, uh, it was spot on. Um, <clears throat> so I share a lot of his views, of course. That's the, that's the bias. And the view I share is that science is this thing that seeks to inquire about the world using experimentation. Um, human beings are this creature living in the world, and we have the ability to use reason. And reason plus science plus preferences and values leads to policies and decision making. And I think in cancer, I think we have forgotten about so many parts of this. We forgot about the evidence part. We forgot the reason part. We forgot about the preferences values. The first thing I'd start with is the preference value, just to remind us. What does a cancer patient want when they come in the office? Well, they want to live longer or live better um, or to have care, somebody caring for them, providing them with care. Um, care helps you live better. You know, uh, care means somebody coming to your house and helping you, you know, with your dishes, perhaps, if you can't do that, or helping you, you know, clean your sheets or do your laundry, those kinds of things. That's part of care. Cancer patients want to live longer, live better. The medicines we use, they have to, they have to do this at the end of the day. If you give the medicines, if you have the medicines and you give it to half the country and the other half doesn't have the medicines and the one half the country, you know, that you don't give it to, let's say you randomize, uh, they don't live any longer, they don't live any better, uh, you've not provided them anything. You know, you're not provided them anything. You can say, well, you know, there was one person here who did really well. Well, I'll go to the other half, the other, you know, the counterfactual half and say, well, there's one, one person you, did, you didn't provide that medicine to and they did really well. They were the tail of the curve anyway. So I guess one is I think we've forgotten what the values are. The values are not improving PFS. The values are not deepening response rate. MRD is not something a cancer patient was born. Oh, I wanted, I want MRD to be lower. No, they want to live longer. And if insofar as drugs that increase the fraction of people who have MRD will achieve that, sure. But if you're just changing a prognostic endpoint in a way that doesn't impact on their survival. You know, you're flipping these people, as I've talked about in some of these lectures on Path CR, and I won't bore you with that. Um, they, they may not want that. You know, it, it, they may not want a biomarker change unless it means something for them. I don't know what my cholesterol is, to be honest with you. I don't know what my A1C is. I really don't know. And I and I, I and I, I could and and I frankly, if you told me you could lower it with a pill, I wouldn't care. I don't know what it is. I don't care about it. But I want to live longer. I want to live better. Um, and that's what we shouldn't forget about cancer medicine. The next thing is the evidence. We are very, very bad at evidence. I mean, I think nobody teaches us, um, you know, what is a p-value? I always rail about this. You know, a p-value is you assume that there's no difference between the two arms. You assume the null. And then if you were to get this distribution or a more extreme distribution, what's the probability that that would have occurred? That's the p-value, the probability that assuming the null, this or more extreme distribution occurs. It's not the probability the hypothesis is true or false. It's related to the number of times you're shooting. You know, how many times you're running the trial? You run the trial a thousand times. You're going to get some trials with nominally significant p-values, of course, because even in, in the null condition, which is what the p-value presupposes, um, these things are tied. They're very related to the trial's agenda. They're very related to, do we use one trial or two trials to, to believe that a product really works? Um, I think the other kind of challenges are we are seduced by these endpoints. You know, I've recently had some roundtable discussions and you can just hear it in people that why they practice the way they practice is a PFS or, or an MRD or something like that. We forget that in the history of oncology, there have been drugs and situations that we improve PFS that don't improve survival and we don't do those things. You know, I give some examples and, and I'm gonna have George Sledge on in a future episode to talk about some of the classics in breast. Um, we have drugs, we have trials like Bellini um, where there was a PFS benefit, but the OS was detrimental. Um, you know, so it tells you that you can't always hang your hat on these surrogates. And then I think the other thing we forget about are the principles of oncology, which is that, you know, I guess what I wanna say, what people want and what companies want are different. Companies want you to take more drugs, all the drugs, sooner, continuous, forever for pre-cancer. Of course, because their market share is huge. 
What do people with cancer want? They want to live as long or as well as possible with the least amount of drugs and the least amount of time on drug. So give me the least amount of drug that can still maintain my longevity and survival. Do they want to take things continuously and drive into the hospital and, and pay for parking and wait in the lobby? Not if they get the same result from being able to stay home, from having treatment holidays or breaks. But I think the modern cancer ecosystem has forgotten all this. And then the, the biggest failure is people try to compare uncontrolled studies. 50 people here, 50 people there. This is better than this. My God, have we learned? Like, it's like you don't know history. You don't know it. You've forgotten everything. These comparisons are not reliable. If they were as reliable as you think, we wouldn't do the randomized study. They have notoriously been unreliable. They've failed over and over again. They're meta-analyses and, and umbrella reviews showing that they're unreliable, and yet you persist. You persist in these things. And so that, to me, is sort of an ignorance of history. Um, and I guess I do see it translate into, um, and, th and then the last thing is, is to recognize that human beings have limitations on what we can do. Um, you know, I guess we're not supposed to talk about COVID because this podcast is moving away from that, but it's related to cancer, it's related to medicine, which is you always think, people always believe they're omnipotent. You know, if something bad happens to your patient, you agonize and you think, well, if I did this differently, they wouldn't have happened, right? But the truth is some bad things will happen no matter what you do. You should still agonize because there's some things you might've been able to do differently, but you should not necessarily assume that you could have saved everybody, you can't. Uh, and what that also means is at some point, people are nearing the end of life, they are dying. And you could try some drug based on some uncontrolled phase two study, or you could have an honest conversation with somebody. And you have to ask yourself, is this person in front of me, is this the kind of person who was actually in that uncontrolled study? The answer is probably not. They're older, they're frailer, they have more comorbidities, they have more organ dysfunction, they have less physiologic reserve. They may not get what, that, what you think that study would mean they get. It doesn't extrapolate to them. And so, as you know, in the, in the last part of the book, I talk about those sort of six cardinal principles. Um, and one is generalizability. Um, but, but I guess the answer to your question, I guess, is we have forgotten what I think this profession's goal is. And we have forgotten what the history of evidence-based medicine would tell us as to how to get there. And I think we don't do a good job of teaching it. Um, in fact, we teach the opposite. The companies are interested in teaching the opposite. Um, and a lot of people have not spent a lot of time studying this space. So I think the book is trying to fill the biggest niche that is out there, the biggest uh, unmet medical need, so to speak, in cancer is actually learning these things. Yeah, yeah. The book does a great job of, of shifting your mindset to keeping the eye on the ball. It kind of gets rid of all the minutia and all the all the hype and it helps you see, you know, what's really important. And I think that's a, a great thing to, to remember, especially for trainees that are reading it as they, if they're going to academia, if they're going to private practice, they have to know what matters and, you know, keeping your eye on the ball, that should be a, a shirt for, yeah for all sure. medical trainees. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into the book a bit. Um, you open up chapter one with a quote from the finance legend, Warren Buffett. Buffett. Yep, where he says, price is what you pay and value is what you get. Now you touched upon value a little bit earlier, but I'd kind of like you to unpack it a bit. What is the concept of value in the oncology space? Yeah, value I think in medicine means um, the benefits that the patient gets um, somehow divided by the cost and the tolerability or toxicity of the drug. It's some relationship between how much longer or better you live and what you pay for that, both in terms of physical suffering as well in terms of monetary suffering. And that is the proposition of value. And I think it's important to never, you know, keep your eye on the ball, keep your eye on value. Because a society, all societies, all healthcare systems, whether you know it or not, we all ration. We not paying for every damn thing for every damn person. Nobody does that. In Europe, what they decide is we will prioritize based on value. With our fixed supply of resources, we will do the things that give people the most longevity and life years. And if you were to assume sort of a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, that's the way you want to live. You don't know what condition you're going to have. You want to be in the society where wherever you may fall by random draw, the society is committed to doing what's best for the people in the society. You know, so that's sort of the veil of ignorance and the Rawlsian sort of view. And I think that's what they do in Western Europe. In this country, we also, we also ration. We ration immensely. Not everyone gets the same care but we don't ration based on value at all. We, for some people, we give things that even, that may not deliver any value at all, that may have no net negative value to the patient, but net value to the shareholder. Um, and for other people, we get no care at all. 
you know, even, even though we have the Affordable Care Act, we still have these tremendous inequities in our society. And so what I wish to suggest is you need to think about value. Um, you need to think about value because anybody who confronts the policy question will always come back to, we will always have to choose what to do. You know, we'll always have that choice. And in such a system, the only rational thing to do is with whatever resources you have, do the most for the most people. As much as you can do, do that. Um, and, and no system would, would say at the outset, we should pick a few people, mostly by virtue of where they were born, do everything for those people and ignore the rest of the people. You know, I don't think that's a, that's morally, that will not fly. Um, and yet that is the situation in the United States, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, when we, we've written a couple of papers and one term that I, I like to use and that I've read um, in other papers is, you know, there's therapeutic toxicity, but there's yeah. also financial toxicity. Right. And when talking about value, that concept of financial toxicity weighs a heavy burden on a lot of people and society, you know. Um, so kind of taking a little bit of a, a, a turn, anecdotes, anecdotes, yeah. your favorite. My favorite. In the book, you touch upon anecdotes. And a reporter once told you, be careful of medical treatments where every news outlet covers the same patient. Yeah. If you can only find one person that did well, that, not, that might not be such a great therapy. But how much of a role do you think anecdotes play on the narrative around certain drugs? In the clinic, do patients present these anecdotes to you? And how do you respond to them? And how would you advise medical trainees to respond to these anecdotes they will for sure counter in their own practice one day. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. I mean, I think um, the first thing to recognize about anecdotes is um, some things that actually work have anecdotes and some things that don't work also have anecdotes. You know, that's the challenge with anecdotes. Um, we all know somebody or may have interacted with somebody who came to us with an anecdote of a colleague, a friend, a family member, somebody they heard about who had cancer and they got high dose vitamin C and they had a full cancer melted away. You know, of course, uh, are we to believe that? And I guess the answer is, I think very few of us believe that um, for a number of reasons. But one thing is that it can't be recapitulated. Um, I think we think about things like, um, 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 uh, recently, I read a case report in the British Journal of Hematology about a person with Hodgkin's lymphoma who had COVID-19, and then the Hodgkin's went away without treatment, uh, sort of a spontaneous remission. And the literature is full of these sorts of spontaneous remissions after some insult. Uh, I think the classic is the 1891 Coley's toxin, you know, whatever that guy administered to the head and neck cancer patients in uh, th that sort of streptococcus uh, slurry that he injected into their tumor. And, and some people had a remission to that, you know, maybe a primitive immunotherapy. But the thing about... Um, and, and then many of these experimental drugs have one person who did super well. You know, what do I want to point out here? I want to point out that, you know, the fact that one person did really well with that, that does not a medicine make. That's a, that's a flash in the pan that may excite you, that may intrigue you. But a scientist's job is to one, try to elucidate why this person, this medicine and this interaction, why did this happen? And is it possible it was due to chance alone? Is it possible it was unrelated or is it possibly causal, but how do I unpack that causality? Because you want to find the thing that actually interdicts on the pathway in the right way. And then taking that thing in a prospective cohort of 20 or 40 or 50 people, apply that thing consistently and see what is the response rate? What do we get? Can we recapitulate it? And so one of the things I say in the book is that both successful and failed drugs have anecdotes. You know, There are drugs that never came to market that if you practice long enough, you will have lived through. And there would be one patient who you feel like did well. Sometimes it's difficult to know if it was the drug that did them, did them well or you know the fact that they had indolent biology. Um, but sometimes you really do feel like there was something there. But the purpose of medicines, of pharmaceutical industry, of, of, of our craft is to isolate that thing and be able to deliver it in a way that is reproducible. You know, and so Rosenberg, of course, famously, he does the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. He's had many flashes in the pan, but has he been able to reproduce it in a scalable, sustainable way? And I think, you know, CAR-T is one thing, but the TILs, I think the answer is no, we don't ha yet have proof of that. Um, and if we did, it would be approved. Um, so I guess what I would say about that is, um, I mean, but your next question is like, what do you do in the clinic? I think that's a very different ballgame yeah. because I think I disagree with lots of people, um, which is that... Um, you know, everyone's in a, everyone's in a alternative complementary medicine bashing phase or whatever. Uh, you need to, you need to, you need to check your judgment. If you're a doctor, you need to, you need to have some humility. 
when you go into their room and somebody tells you that they believe something is the cause of something, um, you know, I think, I think one, you just have to be honest, like have, how much have you actually read about that issue? And I think people, most people haven't read about a lot of these things. So it's just to allow people to have, you know, believe what they believe. You don't need to correct every belief. I mean, their goal of the inner counter is not so they believe everything you believe. Um, but I do think um, your goal is to encourage people to pursue therapies that we have a documented track record of improving survival quality of life, encourage people to make choices that are in line with their goals and desires, to allow people to do things that you may not think are helpful as long as they don't interfere with the first two things. So if somebody tells me they want to, I don't know, you know, buy, buy some statuette and keep it by their bedroom or have some, uh, some seance or, or take some supplement that doesn't interfere with my medicines, I'm not going to fight them on it because, you know, people do lots of things to make ourselves happy. We have certain interior decor even, you know, these are all things we do. It's not my job to judge that. I'm trying to prioritize one and two. When people come to me and they say, I heard an anecdote about something from Israel or something from Dana-Farber or some you know, technology, I, 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 I often read about it. I see what limitations I see in the study, selection bias, you know, it's not reproducible, those kinds of things. I try to explain as well as I can and then kind of point out that you know, right now that's not ready for prime time and you know, here's what is. And, and try to talk about like, what is the evidence base for the things we do recommend, which is often you know, quite good. You know, we have randomized data showing survival benefits or things like that. Um, so I guess I would say uh, one shouldn't be dismissive of anecdotes. Sometimes we learn things through anecdotes. Um, sometimes it's only a few patients and you see a pattern. You know, it was only six people and we saw uh, PCP pneumonia and HIV AIDS. You know, that's how it was discovered from six ca a case report of six people. Um, so you, you shouldn't be blind to patterns and anecdotes. Uh, but at the same time, you should never forget that annex anecdotes don't make medicines. Um, prospective controlled studies make a medicine. Um, and I think that's what's important for trainees to take away. Yeah, definitely. I think the biggest thing in the clinical setting that would be easy to do, especially after reading, you know, House of God is to be brash. Um, and I think the, the, the response to being presented the anecdote is, you know, huge for the physician patient relationship. Yeah. Um, <laughs> deliveries, everything being affable, talking with them, not to them is huge. But I can see that, you know, after you go through medical school, that oh, what are you talking about? Like, no, 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 it's nonsense. Uh, that would yes. be so easy to do, so I feel like. Yes. Yeah, and what Dr. Avi Loeb always talks You paused a second. Let me pause this until it comes. The internet is fixed. Okay, you're back. Uh, I'm back, I'm back. I'm sorry, we're having uh, immense thunderstorms where I am, uh, but I'm back. I'm on hotspot, hotspot connection. Um, remind me where we were. Remind you were me just where saying we were. Avi Loeb talks about Oh, he talks about humility and how important that is. And I think that's especially important when talking with a patient or with anyone, yeah. you know, we have to be humble and, and, and how we communicate and what we know um, and assume the person might know something we don't. Um, I don't, yeah, that's, that's I, why, next, I just, just a side note. That's why I'm, you know, I'm always like baffled with, um, you know, half of what I read on Twitter, which is so combative and uh, like, um, you know, just, 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 it wouldn't fly in a doctor's office. And so I wonder if people are, how much people are practicing, but anyway, go on. Yeah. Go on, let's talk about that. Well, before I, before I go to the next question, I kind of want to expand on it a little bit with what you said um, in response to that question, rule number two of Dr. Mukherjee's book and the laws of medicine is normals teach us rules and outliers teach us laws. Does that mean anything to you? Um, it just came to me, but does that mean anything in this conversation about anecdotes? I mean, I think, uh, I think he means it to mean one thing, which is that um, outliers allow you to identify scientific principles and pathways that you hitherto did not know or appreciate. Um, and, and one can advance science that way. What I would clarify his statement uh, a little bit, and my, I mean, uh, the difference I think between his statement and my, and my point of view would be that I would think, um, Outlier anecdotes sometimes allow you to do what he what he would claim that allows you to find something novel about the mechanism of action or the pathway. Sometimes allows you that, um, but all but more often is spurious. It's just noise. It's just randomness. It's just happenstance. Um, and I think that's the hard part for people to accept is that a lot of uh, you know why did one country do better than the other? Why is this thing happening bad now? Why is not that? Why didn't happen this? You know stochasticity chaos, randomness. This is a phenomenon of biology. You know, um, why did the patient have stable disease for six months and then suddenly it progressed? 
Well, it's possible something changed. It's also possible that you had a few measurement errors. It's also possible it was just growing the same all along. It's also possible that there's a slight change in biology. It's also possible that there is some some a, a window of of tumor growth and it just moves within that. Uh, you know, I mean, th there's a lot of you don't know. And always assuming causality, always seeing a pattern, always thinking you'll find a pathway. I think that is probably not the answer. In fact, it's probably the minority of situations where that happens. It's just that we hear those stories. And so we all think, you know, we're all going to be the person who finds a new pathway, right? We always, we have these hero heroism stories, um, you know, when, when the reality is that science is hard and most science is not fruitful and most people don't discover things. Uh, that's the truth about science. Yeah, awesome. So we were talking about, you know, communicating with patients and Dr. Peter, Peter Atia, who you've been on his podcast. Yeah talks about the four A's of being a physician. And I don't know if he created this, but I'm gonna contribute it to him and someone can correct us if they want to. But one is one we've already alluded to, which is being affable, talking with patients and not to them. Right. The second thing is being available. Third thing is always advocating for patients' needs. And the fourth one, which I wanna touch upon with you is ability, competence, okay? Malignant touches upon the theme of ability a lot such as navigating the decision tree is what you call it. Would you expand on what it means to be an able oncologist? Yes, I guess I would say, uh, I think it's the most important thing in, in whatever we do. I mean, whether it's an oncologist, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're whatever your practice is. And I think that this is a, a clear point where I increasingly find myself at odds with um, with uh, what I, with rhetoric I hear and a movement I hear, um, which is that you know everyone is terrific and everyone is good and we can never have grades and we can never have rankings and these sorts of things. And I, what I want to say is that a lot of rankings and a lot of grades and a lot of metrics are capricious and wrong and they are biased and they actually don't measure what you care about. But that doesn't mean that some people are all the same. That's a different thing. And some people are better than other people. And you got to be better than you were yesterday. You got to be better than you were yesterday. And that means working hard and working hard and getting better. And so, you know, I, I think my objection to so many spaces is from social media where people want to be, you know, a science communicator. It's like, you want to be a science communicator, you got to do science and you have to really understand science and study science. You can't just go and want to be a communicator because you say a lot of shit that's wrong, frankly. Okay. So that's how I view it. Uh, but, but your point about what makes a great oncologist, I think I talk about this in a book in one section, which is, you know, I forget how I put it, but something like, um, the, the step one of being a doctor is, um, okay, the patient has this going on. What are all the things it could be let me make the big list of all the things it could be and what are all the tests that one could order to assess all the things it could be. And when you go on third year clerkships, I think that's the state that most people are in. They're like, oh, here are all the things it could be and here are all the tests that we could order to evaluate all the things it could be. And that's called keeping a broad differential. That's called you know having these tests. Okay, then the next step of, of being a good doctor, I think is you start to think like, well, you know, a few of these tests are more probable than others, and we can create sort of a hierarchy. Let's send these three tests first, and then if those are negative, then we'll send these tests, but it's very likely these will be positive, we'll have our answer, and you start to create this sort of hierarchy. And then I think the thing that oncology brings to it that's extra is you, are, you, you start to know not just all the things it could be and all the ways you could test to assess those things. You know the therapies for all those things and the progno prognosis for all those, ther for all those um, entities, right? And, and then you, okay, so then I know that like, oh, well, you know, these are four things that are curable, you know, and these are five things where, you know, the survival is quite poor. Um, and then you start to know the delta of your therapy. So like, what would it have been if you treat early versus treating late, um, you know, for all these things. And, and so what I want to say is that this knowledge, this back end knowledge, knowledge of the, the strength of therapies and the uh, ability of therapies to work in late versus early stages and the magnitude of benefit and the statistical and, and, and methodologic uncertainties around these estimates, all of this information feeds back into your, into your clinical decision-making and it affects the order with which you work things up. And you might say that like, look, um, these, th these two things are actually more probable, but to be honest with you, if I find them a little bit later versus now, it doesn't make a lick of difference for this person. But these two things are things that if you act upon it very quickly, you know, you will have a huge difference than if you acted upon it late. So those are the things we got to prioritize. We'll do those other tests a little bit later. Um, and, 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 and a good oncologist knows that there's one intervention that um, is not in the textbook of chemotherapy drugs that is a very useful intervention in certain circumstances, and that is time. What happens to something with time? Let time help you. Okay, so 
I don't, I don't mean to have the Bible of how you have to practice medicine. I think it's impossible. It's almost um, uh, outside of human comprehension to write because it is sort of an art and science. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure it can be written in declarative sentences. You know, I, I don't know how it will be captured, but I do think this is part of it. I mean, I, I think this is part of it, which is that as you get better, as you know the evidence base for the therapies, as you know the deltas, as you know the pitfalls of the evidence base, that goes back into your workflow and affects how you practice medicine even before you reach those destinations, making those diagnoses. It affects how you prioritize, when you do scans, what scans you do, how aggressively you look for things, um, how you surveil, whether or not you, uh, you know, uh, you, those sorts of things. Um, so I think you, you keep trying to be better at it. And I guess right, what's the yeah. gold standard? Sorry, the gold standard would be, the gold standard would be, you're in a specific situation. I'm in the workroom with a fellow and maybe a colleague and maybe the residents. And they say, we want to do X, Y, and we want to do this. And I say, sure, I see why you want to do this. And I was like, let me suggest a different path. We'll do Y instead. And they say, okay, well, why your method? And I guess the gold standard for me is, like, I should be so good that I could explain to them why I think my way is more parsimonious in a way that, and let them rip me apart, you know, fight me if you disagree, bring whatever you want to, to, you know, to argue with me. But if I can still persuade you or show you, you know, that this is the best way so that at the end that the person's like, okay, yeah, you know, you're right. That, that's a good point. And we've all been in there. We've been on both sides of that dialogue. Every doctor, you know, call a colleague and they say, hey, you know what? Think about doing this this way. And you're like, yeah, actually that is more parsimonious, you know? And so that's, I think the art of being better at, at oncology. Yeah, but but like you said, being better it's hard, right? It's yeah. uh, it takes work. It's a day in and day out grind. Yeah, it's work. Um, which is you know, is interpreting cancer cancer evidence difficult? Like, why is there so much dispute around so many trials? Like, shouldn't it be a little more clear? And to add one more thing, you know, when you go on Twitter or you go on other podcasts, there's a yes man mentality out there that's for full of congratulations and formalities because maybe people may not be up to the task to dig deep into these trials or even understand the methodology behind them. Now, I don't, but I aspire to one day. Um, so is there like a, 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 a yes man mentality out there or am I mistaken? No, I think you're right. I guess I would say that, I mean, uh, you know, isn't this just a byproduct of the fact that our medical education system fails people? I mean, I, I, I view it. I mean, that's why I, I that's why I, I often chime in on that issue because it is a byproduct of a failing medical education system. It's a medical education system that basically says all those people who taught these courses for a hundred years, we don't want to shake it up so much that we threaten their, you know, their workflow, their jobs. We don't want to bother them. They should be able to teach the same thing they thought in 19 diggity two in 2022. And, you know, we don't want to shake that up too much. Um, meanwhile, what happens is you training uh, cohort after cohort of doctors that have no ability to filter out truthful information from information that has limitations and pitfalls. Um, I see this all the time. I see this with- So do you think, sorry to interrupt you, but do you no. think they're defaulting because it's so difficult to? Do you think they default to formalities like congratulations? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, yeah. This is practice changing. It's a default because they can't, or they- uh, they don't want to face the task of digging deep into these trials. Yeah, I mean, I guess no matter where you are in this world, when the vast majority of sort of technical questions like this, it is very difficult for you to go and make a deep dive yourself and reach your own opinion. And the easiest surrogate is to sniff out what you think the mainstream consensus smart person view is and just pay, that's me, that's me. I agree with them. I agree with all the other smart people because I'm a smart person too. But did you actually read the study? Do you actually have principles that govern your decision making? Are you willing to come on my podcast and debate? And, you know, and of course, no, you know, they often they often bail on that. You know, um, I, I think it is part of it is I think you know you, you talk about it as ability. Um, I don't want to. It's not like people don't have that ability in their in their core. They can do it if they wanted to, or if somebody taught them. I mean, I really view it as a failure of the education, like. If we had a good education system, we would teach them to be really good at this. What, what else are we doing with them for four years? We're teaching them a load of crap, you know, just useless things that are not going to, you know, I was just looking at somebody's studying guide and they were like, this is like a first year medical student. And they're studying like um, cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide, mechanism of action, um, belantamab, mafodotin, mechanism of action. And I'm like, well, what if this person doesn't go into oncology? 
the fuck do they need to know? Blantamab, Mephidotin's mechanism action is BCMA targeting antibody drug conjugate. What the fuck do they need to know that for? They don't need to know that. They, this is what they need to know is if you're presented with a, st a situation, a study in whatever field, how do you appraise what's truthful from what's what's false? Also, how do you navigate? Um, um, uh, I think skepticism versus cynicism. You know, I always point to that a great example, I think that revealed how deficient we are was that recovery trial press release. I mean, this was, um, you know, this was Martin Landry. This is the recovery Oxford study. You know, we're talking about, you know, thousands of people randomized in a pragmatic RCT, pre-specified um, subgroups, interaction coefficients, um, statistical analysis plan, protocol available. And then they announced, I think in like June of last year in 2020, that low, we got a signal, dexamethasone, look at this signal. If you're mechanically ventilated, you're going to get a big survival benefit. If you're on O2, in the hospital, you're going to get a survival benefit. But if you're in the hospital, not on O2, survival decrement, look at the hazard ratios, look at the p-value for interaction, pre-specified, they put out their press release, the statistical plan, the protocol, and, and, you get, and you get big name people. And I'm talking about people who've written some of these best-selling books saying, well, this is medicine by press release, you know? That's what, that's what some Harvard professor said. Um, no, it's not medicine by press release. Medicine by press release is a pejorative term, meaning in the industry cycle, of, of hyping drug products, you often have a press release where there's a delayed publication and the publication doesn't always look like the press release. Okay, that's medicine by press release. That does not apply to a pandemic situation, Oxford investigators, a five cent a pill medicine where the statistical analysis plan and the protocol are published online and they have pre-specified interaction coefficients. This is not that. And you have been trying bullshit every day in your practice, just playing, you know, a cowboy medicine. This is a light in a sea of darkness, and you better grab that light right now. And in fact, that's what the NHS said. They changed the practice that moment. Um, and that's not what happened in this country. I think there's a little bit of delay, and there's a, there, there was a, a deb debate online. And the debate, I think, is a debate that reflects that people have not been trained at appraising evidence rapidly with their own mind. They drift to the fact that, you know, if Gawande says, wait for the paper, we should wait for the paper. But, you know, he's great at writing, crafting mellifluous sentences. But does he know anything about how to interpret trials in the heat of the moment? I have my doubts. I don't see a record of that publication, um, and I don't see that something that he's passionate about. But, you know, everyone wants to comment about everything. But um, the answer to your question, which is, remind me of your question? My question is, um, I mean, it's difficult. Interpreting cancer evidence yeah. is difficult. And I'm wondering if the, the formalities and the, con the congratulations and the yes man mentality is a default to that. Yeah, um, I mean, and I think you hit a lot of those points. I think you hit a lot of those points. I'll just add um, one more thing about the yes man mentality, which is that uh, you, you, you can't, um, there's so much money at stake. There's so many companies involved that somebody who goes hard on an adjuvant AstraZeneca drug, you know, somebody who hits something really critically, um, they may get some professional retribution. They may be pulled out of talks. They may get a talking to, I mean, the conferences are funded a lot by these companies. These, uh, these pay, these, uh, uh, what's it called? These uh, little, um, uh, CME events are often funded by companies. And so, you know, there is a professional uh, 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 push towards being a yes person, uh, a yes man, yes woman, a yes person, just saying, this is great. This, I call them cheerleaders. You know, we have a sea of cheerleaders and we got like five people who want to think about things. And when you talk about the pitfalls in oncology, you know, uh, when I first saw it, started out, I didn't recognize that they always fall into buckets, but the buckets are, of course, uncontrolled studies, big problem. Studies that use surrogates endpoints, big problem. Studies that use overall survival, but the control arm is inadequate, or the crossover is there when you don't want it to be, or not there when you do want it to be, um, that there is post-protocol therapy that's just totally delinquent, um, and that uh, there's some other things that we're working on in our group that I won't talk about. Uh, uh, the non-inferiority margin is super big, so permissive that everything will be uh, non-inferior by definition. Um, uh, these are sort of classic problems. We have a few more we're going to be publishing on. Um, but I think um, you, once you understand those problems, you will see them are omnipresent. And, and you probably shouldn't even run those studies if you see these deficiencies uh, a priori. Yeah. And I like how you put there's a, there's a industry push. And if you don't, if you don't engage in the yes man mentality, then there's a, a risk. Yes. Um, and not many people are willing to take that risk, I guess. Um, conflicts of interest. You know, recently you've, you've shown interest on Twitter and the Surgeon General's recent conflicts of interest. But I would like to touch upon um, the impact of the industry's influence from a macro perspective, but also from a micro. <clears throat> How do conflicts of interest affect the system 
And then how does it affect the physician prescribing the medication? So kind of start from a, a macro and then go in. Okay. I guess I would say, I mean, the system has almost uh, uh, been entirely dominated by the industry. I mean, every part of the system is dominated by the industry. What do I mean by that? I mean, uh, you know, um, of course, the industry runs the companies. They run the companies. They decide how the companies work, what drugs to prioritize. Uh, you know, uh, the industry lobbies heavily for the FDA drug bills. So they decide, you know, what should be the standards of approval. We're going to use real world evidence. Some of that language has been inserted, I think, through vigorous lobbying. Um, what will accelerated approval be? Will it be expanded? Do we, and, and, and all the sort of, you know, even calling it a breakthrough designation, an accelerated designation, these kind of focus group kind of word choices that almost surely originate with uh, the lobbying of the industry to, to generate market. And of course they would do that. They're a tiger and tigers do what tigers do. It's up to us to, you know, to, to cage the tiger. Um, so the industry, of course, is conflicted. Then, of course, the people who work at the FDA, you know, you think that they should be the impartial arbiters. Uh, they're underpaid. They're undervalued. I'm sure. Uh, I, I certainly know they're underpaid. I suspect they're also undervalued. Um, and, and their primary way place they go to work when they're done at the FDA is the industry. Every week goes by. It was like, you know, doc, you know, so and so was a reviewer on Genentech's drug. Now they work for Genentech. And this person was the deputy director. Now they work for this company. This person was this. And now they work for that company. So, you know, they're going back and forth, the revolving door to industry. So, what is their motive? Their goal, career motive is keep my head down. Don't get in trouble. You know, don't ruffle feathers. Don't rock the boat too much. I'm going to go work over there and make three times as much money. So, come on. Let's hold this together um, and let's approve drugs. That's what people want, makes everyone happy. The, the patient advocacy groups. I mean, where are they getting their funding? Predominantly the industry. And what do they say? More drugs, sooner drugs, early access, you know, these sorts of things. Um, they, you know, I can count with one hand the number of groups that have actually said like, hey, I want to know if the drug actually improves survival, reinforce those commitments. You know, they often push the other way towards less evidence, which favors the industry. The academics who write the guidelines, which mandate that Medicare pays for the drugs, they are taking a lot of money personally from the industry and their whole careers are indebted to the industry because they're running clinical trials for the industry where every trial may be kicking them 5% of their income. Uh, you know, it may be giving them some... Um, Sorry, I'm, I pushed something back. They may be giving them some, exactly. some pro professional goals. Um, the journals, uh, the journals are, uh, uh, oh shoot, I won't say one thing because we may be publishing on that, but I will say the journals, um, the editorial boards are conflicted. Um, the conferences, you know, where, where are our professional societies getting their money? The industry from their lavish exhibit halls in the center of the conference that you got to walk through. Um, you know, and then where do the faculty go when they retire as professor? They become vice president of whatever company. So I guess I would say like the whole system really is geared to optimizing the interests of the industry. And sometimes the interests of the industry and patients overlap. Like the interests of the industry are to develop some good drugs, but where they diverge is the industry wants rules where even marginal products get tremendous market share and patients probably don't want that. They want marginal products to get less money to be a disincentive so you get better products. And that's where the things misalign. And I think that's what the book gets at. Um, now the individual doctor, the individual doctor yeah. practicing, you've talked about already, you're dropping an oncologist in private practice. You never taught him how to read papers. You never taught him how to be the line between skepticism and cynicism. So the recovery people who are critical of recovery, that's cynicism. Skepticism is knowing what might not be true and what might be true. So we, 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 so they either err on the side of being cynical uh, wrong, or they don't have the tools to be appropriately skeptical. So they often drift to where the smart people are, which is yes, men consensus. Yes, people. And so the practicing doctor, you know, they're quick to in, and jump on new drugs, even though those drugs have not been proven to be better than alternatives. They're um, easily influenced by the CME events and, and the razzle dazzle of the meetings. And I think they're in a tough spot and they have to keep up with so many things that it's almost impossible to read all that literature themselves. Um, so, you know, to some degree, that's why we make the podcast, to give them a, a few tools to help them, I think, I hope. Yeah, I, I like that answer because, you know, you started with, you know, the, the heavy industry influence from the macro perspective. But then it seems like the physician, it's not intentional. You know, at the end of an individual level, it's not intentional. It's, it's just from a lack of understanding, it seems like. And then you kind of get swayed, like you said, by the hype. And then, um, but it doesn't seem like your classmates in medical school and maybe they did, but maybe, you know, they did not, um, you know, they didn't go into medical school thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to sell out to the industry. It's okay. not like that. It's not like that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's very unintentional and um, which is good, I guess, from a, from a human nature perspective. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> think most going people into medical believe school is, 
Yeah, most you people go, believe go. that they are doing good. And I think most people are good and most people seek to do good in the world. And I think most people understand the good by the ways in which they're taught what the good is. And so uh, I don't think anyone is trying to be bad. I think the incentives in the system that are a byproduct of this, I think uh, the, the, the inability to have independence in the system, the fact that everything is to some degree uh, uh, oblig uh, obligated to the industry, um, that creates perverse incentives that encourage people to do bad things, even though they're, they're good people. And if you create a different incentives, you know, if you had incentives to encourage them not to do some of these things, um, you would get different outcomes. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So we need to change the system, the system and not the individual because deep down we're all good people, hopefully, you know, hopefully, hopefully. but I know we're, we're running short on time. So I have three quick questions. Okay. Three we got about, questions. let's do 10 more minutes because I got, I pushed my call back. So we got some time. Okay. All right. Um, this should take about 10 minutes. So, okay. Um, depending on how, how, <laughs> how you respond to this next one, right. which is from a former reverse host on this plenary session uh, podcast, Dr. Christopher Booth, medical oncologist show. from Queens University. Okay, go. Okay, so I have this question here. What if anything, and in parentheses, if anything, because you could have done everything right, would you have done differently in your training and in your first five years on faculty? Hmm, that is a good question. What would I have done differently? Would be good advice for you know incoming medical trainees as well. Well, I guess I would say, hmm. I guess I would say a few things. I think um, you um, when you, I mean, in, in terms of my training, I mean, I, I I'm very satisfied with my training. I was at University of Chicago for medical school. I was at Northwestern. I went to NIH. I think it was really good training. Um, in terms of um, training, what could I have done differently? I guess um, I tried to do all the things I wanted to do, which is, um, you know, every day when you come home, you should try to read for an hour at some point in the evening, you know, whether that's right before you go to sleep, whether that's right when you get home, you should try to read for an hour, even when you're tired, even when you're fatigued, because if you don't, you're going to kind of not solidify that day's knowledge. So I tried to do that, but, you know, probably I could have done better or been a little bit more rigorous about that. Um, in terms of, I think the fellow to faculty jump is something that, you know, maybe in retrospect, I wish I had known a little bit more, I guess. Um, I think, I think, I hate to say this, even though I am an academic, I think that there's a little stigma against private practice. And I always regret that I didn't explore those options more because I truly do like general hemonk and I do like private practice stuff. Like, I mean, I, I think I would like the efficiency of practice, private practice. I think it's often more efficient than academics. And I guess I, I guess I feel like I'm not sure if that was the right thing for me, um, but I do regret that I didn't even explore it. I mean, I don't think I even gave myself the chance at, um, at looking into, um, you know, any private practices. I didn't learn anything about it. I just immediately disregarded that. Um, and I think that that is something that I do. Uh, I, I, I wish I, I wish I had given it more of a fair shot uh, in the sense that at least to learn about, you know, um, the next thing I think about is I think um, it's easy to, I guess I think you learn a lot of things when you, when you go into the job market. And I think the one thing you learn is that what people promise and what they deliver are not always the same thing. And so I think you don't want to go and make your career choices based on the promise. I think you, you, it is better to see what has actually happened to other people and how did they like it and how many people left and those kinds of things I think are a better litmus test of, um, you know, of, of whether or not you're gonna uh, do well there or not. Um, I think that, I guess the thing that I, I feel like I always did was, you know, it wasn't that long after, I mean, actually it was pretty close to when I was in your shoes, Logan, actually, because you were about to start medical school. When I was about to start medical school, I, um, I remember that moment distinctly. And what did I say? I said, um, I said uh, um, in order to get into medical school, you have to put on a certain face. And I think that face is, you know, I'm a lab researcher. Uh, I've done, you know, um, uh, I've done uh, volunteer work. Um, I, I'm good at science. Um, but some parts of that face, you know, may have felt like, you were faking it. In my case, it was like, am I a lab researcher? I'm, I'm not a lab researcher. You know, like I'm not interested in that pipetting. And when I was getting into medical school, when I was going into medical school, when I started, even my first summer, I think I gave it a 
no, actually, maybe by then I had already given up on it. Maybe my first year was when I gave up on it. But there's some moment in my life when I was about 22, 23, 24, where I was just like, okay, no more. No more of this. I'm never going to tell anyone I'll do anything that I'm not going to do. You know, that's what I just decided. And I said, I said, I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care if I get banned from the, you know, they don't want to take me in this program or I have to go to a different program. I just can't tell people I want to do things I don't want to do anymore. Um, and, and so I've pretty much stuck with that. And so when I, you know, applied for faculty, I was like, look, I'm going to do this kind of policy work, reversal stuff, random projects. And then they're like, oh, will you open about clinical trials? And I'm like, not really. I'm not interested in running a lot of clinical trials. I mean, they take a lot of time and you can't do everything. And I have so many projects I do want to do. So why would I want to do things I don't want to do and take away from what I do want to do? So I, no, I don't. I'm happy to see patients. I love to do that. And I love to, you know, think about these things and talk with people like you and, and do this tumor board. And I, and I didn't have, social media wasn't on my horizon. And I guess if I were to say a tip on social media, I think, um, I have changed how I felt about it. I don't know if I told you this, but you know, I used to think Twitter was democratizing and empowering, and now I think it's anti-democratizing and anti-empowering. I think it is really a runaway train. It's really out of control. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, I think there are too many actors on there who are anonymous. Um, there's too much uh, yeah, distorted opinion and dunking and mean-spiritedness. And so I think... Um, I have tried to change in the sense that I write so much more long form stuff. I put out so much more long form and I try to move off that venue. Um, perhaps I would advise somebody probably never to even get started on that venue. Like don't, I mean, I think people still advise people like it's good for professional networking. I would say, you don't need that. That's one thing I would actually say, you don't need networking. It's overrated. Like <laughs> it's bad to say, but um, you know, you shouldn't try to meet people just because you want to network. That's nobody, nobody likes that. They're, they're going to tell, you know, I mean, if you want to meet somebody because you like their work a lot, sure. But I think the truth is, since so many people are doing work that's indistinguishable from each other, like it's just industry medical writer work, like you don't really like their work. You don't know anything about what they think or what they do. Um, you know, you and I met because you read my book. Well, I'll tell you, my book is, you know, you know something about me. A lot of people don't know because my book is a window into my mind. There's nothing, there's nothing between you and me, but the text, you know, there's no intermediary. Whereas when it comes to, you know, a lot of these kind of trialists, you know nothing about how they are or how they think or anything like that. And so I think, you know, these efforts to network at these things, I think are, are foolish and, and they're not, there's a waste of time. I mean, I think you have to decide what you want to do. Just do that. This is a long winded answer. You got me thinking. Um, no, it's good though. It's good because you actually answered my next question. Um, and it, you know, everything you're saying is, leading you to be your true self. And I think that's so important in a career. Um, and especially for, you know, upcoming trainees to hear and to not feel pressured. Obviously with every job, there's stuff you don't want to do that you have to do to be successful. But you also don't have to commit your entire servitude towards something that you don't even value. Right. And so if, you're, if your work is aligned with what you value, then it's going to be a much more fulfilling career. And I think it's super important to hear from someone like you who is doing what they value um, and what they think is important. Can I, um, can I just go on that before you go to the question? We have, we'll have some time. We'll, I'll get your question. But I guess what I want to say about that is like, I mean, what do I value? Like, this is going to sound really crazy, but you know, you might know this because we've talked so much before, but uh, I value the, I value ideas. Like I actually value the idea. Um, when I hear an idea I've never heard before, when I see that plot, like those people made in our team meeting um, and they showed us that plot. Like I really like, that's like the best part for me. And so I think you have to actually figure out like what you want and what you like. And I like that stuff. Um, and I like thinking about that stuff. Um, and I don't know, I don't think everyone likes that stuff. And I think people have different things they like. And I think one of the biggest challenges is um, you are conditioned to be told that what you like is not acceptable um, because it is not um, you know, uh, uh, sort of a traditional career path or whatever. And some people may like things outside of medicine. That's okay too. Um, but I think uh, you just need to be honest with yourself what that is. And the sooner you figure it out, the better. Go on, what's your next question? Yeah, yeah, the honesty is huge. It's, I mean, it's massive. Um, but that, that was a great answer. So this is my last question. And I know you look up to this person or at least the way he thinks, maybe not his, his brash actions. He's a very brash person. Um, Nassim Talib. Did I say that name right? Yeah, I think I Nassim, name Nassim, right? Ta, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, yeah. Yeah. Um, so similar to his inserto, which yeah. I'm slowly working through. Hold on, sorry. I'm slowly working through about a 
a page a day because it's so dense and I'm not mathematically savvy. But he has the Inserto series, about five books. Yes, yes. Will yeah. there be a third book in this installment? And if so, will it be oncology related? Will there be a sequel or will there be a third book in this, in this <laughs> medicine, health policy, cancer evidence installment? Well, I guess I would say I'm sure there will be at least a third, maybe. I mean, I have so many. Now, um, I have a few ideas of things to write about. Um, what are those things? Um, I guess, you know, seafood. You're going to get always, scooped. You're going to get scooped. I, I, know, I know. I'm trying to be careful what I want to say. Um, well, Sifu and I are always, well, not always, but we have returned to working on something together, which is good, which I think helps both of us think about things and gives us something fun to do. Um, I have like two ideas of things I want to do. I feel compelled to do, um, to write about, and I think they'll be better in a book length. Um, I haven't made any headway into any of these projects, but they're sort of in my mind. Um, they will all, I mean, I don't, I, I guess the answer to your question is, will it be related to medicine health policy? The answer is yes. I don't think I'm really good at talking about anything else. Um, so it will be, will it be like a, a series? I guess I, I don't know. Uh, obviously, you know, people are people. And so the way we think is rather hopefully consistent with our prior thoughts. And so there'll be some similarities to, I think the way I write and the way I think, um, but I hope it'll be in different spaces. I think most of what I feel about oncology has been said in malignant. So there's not much to add to that. Um, maybe a few more papers to, to talk about. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate all the, all the wonderful and insightful answers and I will leave you with the final word. Okay. I guess the final word, the final word is, um, uh, I guess. Um, All right, here, hold on, hold on. Okay. I have one more question okay. that, uh, that will be the final word. Okay, okay. saved me. Okay. Tim Ferriss, very famous podcaster, very famous podcaster. I adopted this from Tim Ferriss, but modified it for the context of this discussion. What advice would you give to a smart, driven medical trainee about to enter the quote, unquote, real world of oncology, real world? What advice should they ignore and what advice should they take? You mean you? No. Uh, no you somebody no. going about to go to like faculty job or you take the first job? Where are we? Real world, whatever that means to you, whatever that phrase means to you, real world oncology. I guess I would say don't believe everything you hear. I mean, I guess that's what I'd say. Like, um, I don't know, be curious um, and try to figure things out for yourself. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I pride myself on and I try to be better at is, you know, when we make decisions on the wards, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, this is all about decisions. I mean, this is all about decisions that we're making for patients, with patients, uh, on the wards, in clinic. Um, you know, these are about medical decision. This is medical decisions. Uh, these decisions have importance. The, what we're dealing with is very important. It's cancer. It's one of the most important problems there are. Our therapies are potent. We are one of the people who have therapies so potent they can, they can kill. You know, not a lot of people have therapies that potent, at least as they administer them. Um, we have uh, uh, uncertainty galore. Uh, so when you have uncertainty and important problem and in powerful therapies, you need to be judicious and cautious and question things. And you really, at step one is you need to be able to articulate why you're doing what you're doing. Oh, we're going to anticoagulate this person. Okay, why? Why is this the person that needs lifelong anticoagulation? What's the basis of that? Are you sure? How much are they going to benefit? What would happen if you didn't do it? Well, then what would happen to them? And then they say, oh, well, then they were definitely clawed. Oh, what's the probability they clawed in eight years? What's the probability they clawed in five years? Give me a number. And, and, and then you'll have to go, do some homework. What is that number? You know, let's say cancer. I'm going to do this or that. Why this drug? Why not the other drug? Why this treatment? Why? Um, uh, well, you know, because it improves MRD, PFS. How do you know improving PFS right now is going to make a difference in their life, their duration? Oh, I don't know. Um, are, and then what about, then we can ask this question, which is like in every instance in oncology in the last 50 years where there was a doctor who tried to deepen that surrogate or a surrogate in any setting, how often were they vindicated in subsequent studies? What's the answer to that question, you know? And that's the kind of research that I'm interested in. Um, but I think that's that's the core of, I think, being, a good real world person is to start to think about problems in this way. Now, let me draw a line and let me talk about the patient side of things. Because Chris Booth always reminds me that I should talk about it because I think it's the most, it's super important, which is your first A, affable. I mean, I think you have to realize that this is a caring profession. You know, your goal is to care for somebody. And so you want to be, I think, warm, friendly, empathetic, 
never too empathetic. You know, that's and humble the, and humble and hum. Of course, hum, yeah, humble. Um, you want to feel your patient's pain. I, it's inevitable you will. I mean, anybody you get to know well, if things happen to them that hurt, uh, you will feel it. But you can't feel it as much as they feel it because then you're going to lose your impartiality. So you're always going to be walking this line between, I think, empathy and distance. And there's something there where you can make decisions a little bit better. You do that because people, you know, um, they, they, they need that from a doctor and you need to figure out what that is. And I guess I would say the best way you can figure that out is um, when you are a fellow, you find the people who are good and you grab onto them and you shadow them and you go in the room with them and you see how they do it. And that's how I did it. And um, when you find anybody who's good in medicine, grab onto them. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll learn a lot more than you will from the people randomly assigned to teach you, you know, in this world. Right. You know, yeah, gonna, that's, yeah. that's great advice. That's great advice. Okay. My, my closing thought down. about you, oh, yeah. you go, you go. Okay. You did about a great me, job. Uh -oh. You're, you're a born podcast host. You listen to a lot. So thank you so much for doing this, Logan Powell. I appreciate it. Uh, you're going to be a medical student. Um, you know, working with you is terrific. You've, you've, you've changed how I feel about uh, a whole generation of people because you've done such a good job. So, so now I, I view your generation with the highest, the highest regards. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> That's all, my, all I have to say to that is uh-oh. Um, Got to be careful what you wish for, but I appreciate it. Um, and hopefully many more to come, um, many more papers, many more projects. And I appreciate the opportunity the opportunity to be a reverse host on the plenary session. You're the second, the second reverse host. Let's go. It's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Logan. Thank you.